I've just got the uh, easy job of explaining in 10 minutes open data, link data, and, uh, and the technical challenges of this uh, project. Actually, they're not technical, ultimately. They will turn out to be human. They will turn out to be about how far we can persuade uh, collaborators to actually provide data, data that's fit for purpose, the extent to which we can understand how to move from a very siloed world. This is, um, this is a very old but very straightforward and simple slide. Linked data is nothing mysterious. Um, and it just reflects the fact that the web is evolving. Uh, when Tim Berners-Lee, we were fortunate, Wendy and I, to, uh, and are fortunate to work with Tim, um, when he kind of built the web, when he built, didn't build it, of course, that's one of the great mistakes. He gave us the, uh, the standards to allow us to kind of build the web. He solved a ridiculously simple but hard problem of how to connect a world full of disparate systems together to allow the hyperlink to work across document universes, across the whole planet, to flatten the planet and give us the extraordinary power of the web. And his vision and our vision, when Wendy and I founded Semaphore back in 2004, our vision was about realizing a next stage in the, in the web. And it's not about to happen. It is happening. It's just that somebody wonderfully said about the future, it's here, it's just unevenly distributed. Okay. So what we have to kind of do is look at those examples and say, this is what a web could be. What is a web that instead of connecting between the documents as we see here, but actually connects inside the databases and the spreadsheets and links the facts and data together rather than large amounts of exegesis, large amounts of documentation. What does that web of data look like and why would it matter? Well, it's being realized. There is already billions and billions of facts out there that are connected in what we call the linked web of open data. Now, this is a particularly interesting part of the web because the data is there for anybody to reuse and use. And it contains things like a comprehensive set of all the geographic place names on the planet. Well, not all of them, but a lot of them. Open to use with an open license. Or indeed, a whole range, increasingly, of government data. Again, Tim and I were involved in the early days of getting government to make its data that it kind of has tended to hold on to and get its arms around or silo away in a spreadsheet or a database, make that publicly available. Everything from train timetables to where the schools are to the legal, property, the legal properties in this country or indeed the company's house registers. There is literally thousands of data sets out there which if they were openly available would drive innovation. So we're moving into this world and indeed already what we see in the world is an emerging new kind of infrastructure. And it can be quite hard to get your head around because it's a data infrastructure. It's soft. It's not like the power grid. It's not like the canals or roads which you can point to and concretize. It's about the fact that we have registers of all the legal companies in this country that are web accessible. That is to say, I can take that identifier, click on it, and get data back about that company. Click on that particular identifier for a bus stop and get data back about where it is, what its geocode is, or a postcode, or an administrative region, or dot, dot, dot. We are building a data infrastructure which is a public good for us all to begin to use. So that's happening now. And in fact, the commercial world is already exploiting this. People may or may not be aware that Google, when you type in a search term, in this case, a bit of self publishing you know, this is me Googling myself. How narcissistic could that be? Um, but it's returning what we call the knowledge graph or the knowledge panel. There in the right-hand side, there's a set of structured data that Google has assembled out of all the openly available data and a little bit of understanding about what the links mean. So the web of linked data is already being exploited by one of the planet's great internet companies. And it's something that they like to use for competitive advantage. This is something we should all be beginning to use. Okay. So here's a vision. Now this is, um, lest you get too excited, this is slideware, not to be confused with software. So this is our vision of what Skills Planner might look like if we get hold of the data and we are able to begin to integrate it. As we know, we can. We'll be able to integrate it with our underlying linked data platform. 
So we have done this in many application areas already. Um, and here is London, and here is the route of Tideway. And what we're doing here is we're selecting on sets of features here. Uh, that were, so these are Tideway sites. Uh, we're going to select on those and have a look. Tideway sites and Tideway tunnels, and they're marking them. This is all very obvious overlay stuff, but increasingly we're able to do that very efficiently with our new data linking technologies. And here we've got the London boroughs. Now we've got all that administrative data freely available from Ordnance Survey, we can overlay that on our map. And we can begin to look now at how that geographic context is shaped in terms of the labor forecast. So here's um, data that we have around the estimated cost, the man years it will take, 17, nearly 18,000 man years in the project. Different shadings there show you from 2014 to 2025 the kind of various curves of demand for different professions. Now, we know some of this at this point. It will change and evolve through time. We need live data feeds to animate our software, and that's where all of you will come in. So here we begin to see, as we uh, imagine 2015, you're starting to see a little bit of shading here. This is kind of representing the anticipated workforce demand in the relevant sectors from the London boroughs. 2016, 17, 18, 19, we can see some particularly high net contributing regional um, areas. One of the interesting questions to ask, of course, is as we begin to connect this project to others, can we begin to marry and match the overall supply so that it's not all being drawn down from one particular area? Or we can sort of match the level of demand. You can see we're going now, we're starting to run down into the project. This is the forecast by terms of employment sector. And what's interesting about this is that well over 60% of the required professions are either engineering professionals or skilled construction. There's a real demand for core skills here. And to Andrew's point, how do we find out what that level of demand will be? Well, here it is. It's starting to be reflected. This is the best guess of how different sorts of sector will be landing through the course of the project. Now, this is the kind of planning tool. This is the kind of engine that we need and of course, hopefully, we'll be able to put some analytics on this to kind of draw some, draw some con conclusions and possibly adapt and change and modify our views. Here's a breakdown of the particular view across skilled construction types, from carpenters to steel fixers to miners to electrical fitters. And of course, that then starts to take us into the whole question about what's the educational provision. We know where all the educational providers are. Um, if we want to look at just those private providers that are construction course offerers, that's the map. That's the subset. And then, of course, the question is, well, how do they relate to the area and geography and the demand requirement? So this slide where hopefully is starting to animate for you a sense of what the tool will be able to do with the data assets linked together. And now we look at a particular college here, South Thames College. This is its anticipated intake modeled through time from 2011 through to 2016. Now, this is what it's been currently doing in terms of construction courses. So we already know. It's like demography. We already know whether there's going to be a bulge or a boom or a bust where the scarcity might be. And the trick, of course, is then to begin to plan for that. So here are the number of learners that this college will provide, what the regional geography is, what's the actual student features. Again, Andrew was talking about this whole notion of being really thoughtful about ethnicity, about the male-female split. Well, that's already looking a bit you know, of a challenge. Um, no less a challenge in computer science, I, I hasten to add. It, it's, it's really quite depressing how much we have to do to uh, not just worry about the BME or the ethnicity, but to worry about just basic gender balance. Qualification outcomes in terms of level one, two, three, these are the levels, these are the types of material courses. So we'll be looking all the time to try and match up course provision with the expected demand and, uh, and so on. So the vision here is dynamic data linked together to give you a sense of not just what the project requires, what this supply and the demand function looks like, not just for this project, 
but for all the big civilian projects, potentially across the capital city. And then more widely, this is the way the world is going. And I would predict that whilst we'll be able to furnish the technical platform, the real challenge we will bruise our toe endlessly on is getting hold of the data, finding out whether it has any quality attributes we care about at all. Is it, is it any good? And is it actually categorizing the things we care about? So data is often collected and presented to us with just the wrong codes or just the wrong set of divisions. Given the modern workforce, it's collected against categories that seem fit for the 1950s. So how do we actually build dynamic classifications of this workforce? Because data should not be fixed. It should be dynamic and varying through time. And I think at that point, I'll shut up and allow a panel to, uh, to debate the thought. Okay, thank you.